May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Please sit. Good morning. Good morning. Happy St. Matthew's Day. So, in my own unique style, I'm preaching on Mark. <laughs> I'm pretty certain uh, Matthew's taken umbrage to this. Part of my process involves that I type certain bits of it in different colour texts, so it highlights different themes. Uh, I seem to have run out of coloured ink. So I spent about an hour overwriting the very faint bits on the sermon. <laughs> so I do apologise, Matthew. The ninth chapter of Mark begins with a glorious vision. Jesus shining in dazzling light on the mountaintop. What a sight that was. Peter, James and John shaded their eyes and saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. Then a cloud descended on the mountain, just like in the days of Moses, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. The three disciples present must have been dying to tell the others about that vision and that voice. But Jesus had been very firm on this and ordered them not to say anything to anyone. If they'd been able to talk about that mountaintop experience, surely they would have convinced the others that they were the greatest of the disciples, mm. the chosen ones. Why were the disciples even arguing about greatness while they walked along the way? Jesus had just told them about impending betrayal and death. This was the second time he'd foretold them of what was to come. Maybe some of them finally heard the last line about rising again. Once they got past the betraying and the dying, well, a few of them began to dream of being in high places with Jesus. When he got home to Capernaum, the chapter that began on the mountaintop came crashing down to earth. What were you arguing about on the way? Jesus asked them, even though he clearly knew. I guess that for the disciples, this was one of those awkward moments that we all find ourselves in from time to time, the ones where we get caught out. In fact, in the passage immediately before this text, Jesus was telling the disciples, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after three days he will rise from the dead. In view of this, I'm tempted to think that the disciples were not talking about power as to who should be in charge, but about their own capacity to go through this looming period of trial. Perhaps about the capacity to suffer with Jesus, or about who had the greatest capacity to endure, or even about the capacity to pray, in which case their discussion about who, who was mighty and the greatest of prayer warriors. In terms of our own context, as as if the disciples were talking about or assessing whether and if and who had the capacity, the strength, or the relevant pastoral skills for ministry at a time like this, a time that includes suffering and death. This could be an interesting topic for discussion, and I might be stretching human nature more than a bit on this point, What's important, however, is Jesus' response to these questions that were on the disciples' minds, even as they now kept awkwardly quiet. Then Jesus sat down more formally and tried again to get through to his disciples. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. The same story, or should I say argument, can also be found appropriately for St Matthew's Day in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of St Matthew in verses 1 to 6. One slight difference, the final verse contains a dying warning to all who cause a child to sin. In both Gospel stories, the disciples had argued about who was the greatest of all, and Jesus called them to be last of all. No wonder they were silent. Their eyes started to glaze over, for they have heard these opposites before. To save life, lose life. To be first, you have to be last. To be great, be a servant. Jesus was always talking this way. But Jesus could see that they didn't get it. 
I've sat across the table in many a management meeting and seen the same look. They're listening, but they're not hearing. They just don't get it. And the number of times I've wished I've had St Matthew sat next to me in the budget review meetings are countless. <laughs> so Jesus took a small child in his arms and put the child in the midst of them. Whose child was this? Perhaps a child of one of the women who was part of Jesus' community. Perhaps a child of one of the disciples or a relative of Jesus because Jesus was now at home. Whoever the child was, Jesus saw the child. This child was as important to Jesus as the vision on the mountaintop. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Peter, James and John must have remembered the voice from the cloud. They knew who sent Jesus. While they were thinking about heavenly visions, they saw Jesus holding a child on his lap. Jesus wanted them to see the child. He wants us to see the child too. And welcome the child, not because the child is innocent or perfect or pure or cute or curious <laughs> or naturally religious. Talking about me here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe not. Jesus wanted them to welcome the child because the child was at the bottom of the social heap. Children have no influence at all. They can't advance a career or a person's prestige. Children can't give us things. It's the other way around. Children need things. Things must be done for them. And apparently that continues when they've grown up and left home. <laughs> Who'd have thought? <clears throat> in Mark, children are often sick or disabled. Jairus' daughter is near death when her father kneels before Jesus. The Syrophoenician, I can't believe even type that, it's so hard to say. The Syrophoenician woman's little daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit. And just before today's text, a man brings his son to Jesus. The boy had experienced terrible convulsions since childhood, and the disciples weren't able to heal him. But Jesus commanded the spirit to leave the boy, then lifted him to new life. Children in Mark are not symbols of holiness or innocence, but more often they are the victims of poverty and disease. Jesus brings a child from the margins and into the very centre. This child is not a symbol, but a person. A little person easily overlooked, often unseen and unheard. But surely we are different. We value children in church and in society. Church growth strategies often include children. What do people look for in a church? Right up at the very top, before or after adequate parking, is childcare space that is cheerful and well supervised. But if we listen to some Christian voices in the public square, there seems to be more passion about unborn children than the well-being of children once they're born. All global leaders need to remember that budget cuts to any form of benefits system have deep consequences that ultimately affect the lives of our children. Sometimes it feels that the worst thing that can happen to a child is getting born. Before birth they are cherished, but after birth they are often on their own. Jesus wants us to see the children, to bring them from the margins and hold them on our laps. Do you see this child? Jesus is asking his disciples and us. Whoever welcomes this child welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. This sounds lovely, but by the next chapter, the disciples have forgotten the child. When people bring little children to Jesus for a blessing, the disciples speak sternly to them. As we emerge from the lockdown protocols and enter some form of new normality, we should ponder if perhaps the disciples' scolding sounds a bit like some Christians' protests when children make too much noise during worship. They fidget, they play video games in the pews. How many screaming children can people tolerate while they're trying to pray or sing 
or listen to the sermon. But do we welcome children? Yes, I think that in this area, St Matthew's excels. We really are welcoming. It's what drew Mrs Brown and I here. We've had experience being asked to leave a wedding when a six-month-old James decided to sing along. <laughs> As you can imagine, that wasn't well received by Mrs Brown. But one pause for thought is, do we intentionally include at least one song that children can sing, even if they don't know how to read? Was Jesus a hopeless romantic when he set a little child in the midst of the disciples that day in Capernaum? No, Jesus was not a hopeless romantic. He was a hopeful fanatic. Jesus was fanatical about opening up the commonwealth of God to those nobody wanted to see. He was fanatic about extending hospitality to those considered to be more than property. Jesus didn't follow the rubrics or the rules. He healed when he wasn't supposed to, touched people he shouldn't have touched, and talked about suffering after a wonderful moment of glory on the mountain top. Jesus taught us that the commonwealth of God is not up, but down. All our arguments about greatness mean nothing if we don't stoop down low enough to see the invisible ones in our midst. That day in Capernaum, Jesus held a little child in his arms and brought the words of heaven down to earth. I can imagine Jesus whispering in the child's ear, You are God's beloved child. Then Jesus looked over the child's shoulder at his disciples and even farther off. Jesus is looking at us. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This isn't as simple as it sounds. It means caring for children if we have none of our own. It means being committed to children's health programmes. Jesus wants us to see not only our children and grandchildren, but the children of migrant workers sleeping in the field, and the child who moves from shelter to shelter every night. This means bending down low enough to see the child who can't see any higher than our knees. We may not be able to do that at all unless we're willing to become hopeful fanatics. Let us pray. Holy and ever living God, you have named us as your beloved children. Move within our hearts so that we will bend down low enough to see the children in our midst and care for them as though they are part of our